And I'm sure when you have people from outside of Santa Barbara come to Santa Barbara, the first thing they say is, what an amazing place. This is a magical place. And for me, it's especially great to be here because I just moved away after living here for seven years. I, I just recently moved to Portland. Uh, and you can imagine the weather there is a little bit different than it is here. So even though it is cloudy here, the jasmine blooming at night when I came in last night just reminded me how lucky uh, we all are to have a place like this and to, to live in a place like this. And that this institute, how lucky we are to have uh, a, an institute like this where we can come and share ideas like that. It's, it's a real, real treasure for me to be back in Santa Barbara and to be here today talking with all of you. So thank you all for coming, especially. As Robert mentioned, I am a PhD candidate at UCSB and I am in the history department. I'm a historian. My dissertation is really um, a, a a thought piece about the issues of science, technology, and the environment, but it's really about the rise of global environmentalism. I, uh, like the Institute here, I'm really interested in, in global thinking, global interactions and interdependence. So my dissertation works from the late 50s to about the mid 70s um, and deals with some of the political context that happened around environmental issues for the first time at a global scale. Uh, and I'm happy to chat about that afterwards, but here today I'm really to talk uh, about part of this $13 billion funding from the government funded part of my grad school. So I'm very actually very appreciative of our government for that. Um, I am a fellow at the Center for Nanotechnology and Society at UCSB, which is a, a really unique institution uh, across the nation. It's, there's only two like them in the, in the country, and we happen to have one here just right around the corner. So what is the federal government doing funding a historian, a humanist, a person who's interested in telling stories about people and their relationships to each other and to the outer world? What is that? Why are they funding a historian to look at nanotechnology? So the way I'd like to approach that is, um, and I'm going to be using the um, slides up here, and so I'm going to kind of be going back and forth. I'll be talking through all of it, but I'll also be making reference to some of the, some of the things on the slide there. So I apologize for those that might be tweaking their heads like a tennis match. Um, so the question is, if is, isn't nano new? Isn't nano done by scientists? Why a historian? And I like to point to Aristotle for an answer for that. And he said, uh, if you would understand anything, observe its beginning and its development. And so the way that I tend to understand things is to really understand how they've evolved and, and where, how they got to where they are uh, and what different opportunities there were for branching off in different directions. That's one of the things we do at the Center for Nanotechnology and Society is to really to understand nanotechnology. We need to understand where it's coming from, let alone what it's doing now. <clears throat> Another quote that I'm, really inter I'm interested in sharing with you here is this one by Lewis Mumford. Scientific knowledge has not merely heightened the possibilities of life in the modern world, it has lowered the depths. When science is not touched by a sense of values, as it fairly consistently has worked during the past century, it works towards a complete dehumanization of the social order. Now we can debate whether that we agree with Mumford on this, but the question I'd like to pose to you first is, is not necessarily what the meaning of this is, but what's the context? What are the context clues you have up on there? For what's the context that Mumford is saying this? Who is that guy, and why is he saying it at that time? And, and this, by the way, is an opportunity. I, I would like this to be an open discussion. If people have questions in the middle of things, please, please say something. Raise your hand. Let it be known. This is, a, this is a forum for us to talk about these ideas and bounce them around. I certainly don't have all the answers, but I think we can at least wrap our heads around things collectively. Um, so to, to get started, what's the context for this? World War I. All right. Yeah. So this was written in 1922, right? World War One has just happened. This massive industrial warfare on a scale never seen before, and Mumford's thinking about the ways that science helped shape that war, helped make that war as destructive as it was. Um, now let's take a step back. What's the meaning? What's the message Mumford's trying to get here? What's he saying to us? Science has to be very ethical. Yeah, yeah. there needs to be a sense of values involved in this. Science can't just be its own process for its own sake. What I, what I like to do, think about this is that, um, and if there's nothing else that anybody walks away from, from, from today's discussion, it, I hope that it's this, is that science is constructed within social contexts. It's conducted within social contexts, and it has social consequences. Now, that's important enough that I want to say it again. Science is constructed and conducted within social contexts, 
and it has social consequences. Science does not stand alone as its own thing, as its own existential being, right? It's a part of the world. Another way to get at this is, is playing a little bit of science semantics, and that's kind of what I have down at the bottom of this slide. Um, and the reason why I want to do this is context matters and meaning matters, but words matter. Words matter a lot because words shape our thinking. We think through our words, and our thinking shapes our perceptions of reality. So words matter a whole lot. When we talk about science, we often think about science as a body of knowledge, right? as a thing, as a noun. Science tells us that electrons and protons repel each other. This is the knowledge we have from it. Science tells us that birds evolve from reptiles. This is part of the body of knowledge of science. But science is also something else. It's a process. It's not just a body of knowledge. It's something that's moving and evolving constantly. And that's where the social context come in. This process of knowledge construction is always changing. And in the process of changing, it shapes what we know as the body of knowledge of science. So this idea of science as a noun and science as a verb, as a thing and as a process, a moving, evolving thing, those help us really understand what science is. I like to think of this in another way is love as a noun and as a verb. That's kind of a way that I, I can relate to this. Love as a noun is a feeling. We don't really have a lot of control over our feelings, right? You love who you love. And some, par some, some parts of society frown upon who you love or who you don't, right? And, and we're working to change that. But love as a verb is something different, right? That's your choice to love. That's who you're going to act lovingly towards. So if we can think about science as a noun, and love is a noun, love is a feeling, versus love is an action, love is a, is a choice, love, love is doing, right? We can think about science as action as well, something that's doing, that's a choice. How we do it matters and it changes. And also, these things are mutually reinforcing, right? The same way that you can have the feeling of love that comes and goes, it ebbs and tides. You, again, we don't have a lot of control over that. And especially in a long-term relationship, the peaks and valleys of it, right? Those are the feelings of it. But the actions of loving, choosing to love, those end up, I've found, helping reinforce my feelings of love, right? So the action of loving helps build the noun, the feeling of loving. Science is also the same way. The process of building our knowledge helps shape what that knowledge is, right? So today, we are talking about the global frontiers of science and society, right? And what nanotechnology's role is in this, especially its social context. Now, nanotech is usually described as the cutting edge of modern science. This is one of the, the newest fields that we are a part of that's going to shape our lives in big ways. Um, but some of the things we'll hopefully you can get out a little bit later is that nano has a much deeper and stranger history. And, and helping understand that history helps us understand some of these social contexts for where this cutting edge is going. So the outline for today's talk, just to show you the directions we're going to be moving in. First, kind of a, a primer. Robert mentioned some things, but we're going to get a little bit more detail. What is nanotechnology? What are its definitions? What are some of the properties of nanoparticles? What are some of the benefits and risks that arise? And that's, um, this is more, and I, again, I'm not a scientist, but I study science, and so I'm going to do my best to, to try to present nanotechnology from a historian's point of view. Um, the next portion of the talk is to talk really about what the Center for Nano in Society does. We call it CNS, um, the Center for Nanotechnology in Society. What do we do and how do we do it? How are we organized? Um, just to give you a, a sense of, of what that is that's going on just down the road here. And then if there's time at the end or if you're interested, I have some examples of talks and presentations that I've given in the past on my historical research and also some research that my advisor has, has created, um, thinking about how do, we, how do we think about the history of nano and how can we use that history, how can we apply history to help shape the world that we live in now, whether for policy senses or whether for just public understanding. So that's where I'd like to go in the talk today. Um, the first part, what is nanotechnology? Now let me ask you all, when you think of nanotechnology, when you hear of it, what comes to mind? What are the, th the images or the stories that you've heard of? What, if you, what do we know about nanotechnology as a group today? Printed circuit board. Uh, what now? Printed circuit board. Printed, printed circuit board. Cool. What else? What is Stained glass. Stained glass. All right. Very cool. That's a... That's a an, um, 
since the fifth century, people have been using nanoparticles to create uh, different types of stained glass, especially red stained glass. Can use it in medicine? Use it in medicine? Yeah, excellent. Okay, medical applications. Other thoughts on nanotechnology? Uh, spray glass with a fluid that has nanoparticles create electricity. That's right. All right. Design. Yeah, so trying to create solar, um, more efficient solar panels that you can even put on glass that's see through. Um, there's also some nano products that people have, have, are building towards that are self cleaning, that they basically eat dust and dirt and remove it and, and move it out the side. Other thoughts? I have to say, I think it has a lot of commercial excitement about how to create a lot of products itself. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely, yeah. yeah. The commercialization of this, this stuff is, is a big reason. It's one of the big reasons why the federal government funded nano in the first place. Uh, and we can get into a little bit of that later. One thing I haven't heard you guys talk about is some of the, the fears about nanotechnology. Not too long ago, Michael Crichton published a book, Prey, that was basically about nanobots run amok, self-replicating and, and spreading over the world. And this is a legitimate thought. Um, in the same time that Michael Crichton wrote his book, Prince Charles, heard about nanotechnology and these ideas of self-replicating nanobots and presented in a major speech to the English public saying we need to be really concerned about what was called the gray goo problem. That self-replicating nanobots could continue to self-replicate uncontrolled to the point where they would form a blob, like the movie, the 50s movie, The Blob. And eventually, because of exponential replication, that there are so many of these things, that it would literally take over all of the biosphere. Right? Um, that as a thought seems pretty nuts, but when you also think that bacteria, when bacteria evolved and wasn't on the planet initially, but evolved into life, took over the planet and changed our atmosphere. The oxygen that you and I breathe is a result of bacteria creating life processes on the planet, changing our planet, right? And we are here because of that. So these sorts of ideas aren't too far out of the range. Um, Mold, right? Yeah, yeah. Concerns about about um, or, or viruses that can't seem to, can't seem to be killed that are just able to keep growing. So these ideas of nanobots—that's something that you, you all haven't mentioned. You are really thinking in the scientific application contexts, um, but this is something that's part of the pop culture ideas of nanotechnology. The government ideas of nanotechnology are a little bit more towards the lines that y'all were thinking, right? They were billing, the government was especially billing in 2000 when President Clinton announced the National Nanotechnology Initiative that nanotechnology, the, the, the use of these nanoparticles was going to create an industrial revolution. It was the key to the next industrial revolution. A National Science Academy report talking about analyzing the National um, Nanotechnology Initiative described this as an endless frontier. Now that's actually hearkening back to a 1945 report that was about the role of science and federal investment in science creating an endless frontier. That essentially nanotechnology would be the ability to push the edges of science forward. Right? So the government is pushing a certain, a certain idea of, of this as, as manufacturing processes, creating new products, new processes that will change the way we live, maybe disrupt entire industries. So which is it? What is nano? Are they micro-machines? Are this is some sort of engineering practice where we're making smaller and smaller machines that could maybe live inside our bloodstreams, help repair cells, maybe fix neurons in our brains that aren't quite working properly, solve things like Alzheimer's? Or is this really more about material science? Is this basically just new forms of chemistry? There's a debate in the understanding of what is nanotechnology, and it's happening, as you see here, these are dates from the 1990s, the, the 90s, right at the, kind of the, the dawn of public thinking of nanotechnology, two different strands of what is nano and which direction are we going to move in. I think knowing the social life of nanotechnology helps us wrap our heads around these two different strands. So that's a little bit of the direction we're going we're gonna to go move towards uh, eventually, is what is, this, what is the nanotechnology in society? Where did it come from? How is it used today? And how is it going to shape where we're going? But first, a little bit background on the nanotechnology and what it is. First off, size matters with nanotechnology. It's a, it's a really important feature of nano. We wouldn't be talking about it, it and its new pro properties if we didn't really think about its size component is really the major issue. 
So the definition of nanotechnology, at least from the National Nanotechnology Initiative, the U.S. government's definition, which is not the same as other governments, is that nanotechnology is science, engineering, and technology conducted at the nanoscale, which is about 1 to 100 nanometers, where unique phenomena enable novel applications. When you get down to that scale, the 1 to 100 nanometers, and again, 1 nanometer is 1 billionth of a meter, all sorts of new chemical and physical properties are possible. And particles react in ways that you, we would never expect them to react in a bulk size. But let's try to wrap our heads around what is this nanometer scale. Nano comes from the Greek word, uh, it's the prefix nano, comes from the Greek word for dwarf. And the size scale is just phenomenally small. Um, to wrap our heads around it, if we had a one millimeter size nano, um, a one millimeter size pinhead, one million nanometers would fit on that. One million. So if you think of a pinhead, think of cutting that up into 500, 1,000, a million pieces. So infinitesimally small. The red blood cell is about 2.5 micrometers, which is 2,500 nanometers. We're talking about engineered particles. On the far right, you see this, an image of a carbon nanotube. It's a unique form of carbon that we've only learned about since the early 1990s that's only 2 nanometers wide. Two nanometers. Here's another game that will help us uh, try to understand scale here. Um, when we're talking about scale, nanometer is to a strand of hair what that strand of hair is to a house that's about 10 meters wide. All right, so one nanometer to a strand of your hair is the same thinking of what a strand of hair looks like to about the size of this building. So crazy small. Um, if we took a four nanometer particle, the, the very bottom example there, and multiplied it by a million, that nanoparticle would only be about as big as an ant. If we did that same kind of mathematical explanation on the ant, if we multiplied that ant by a million, it would be as long as one lap around the Indy 500 racetrack, four kilometers. So the scale of this stuff is unbelievably small, and yet we're at the point now where our science and technology can not only see these particles, but create them and try to manipulate them, use them, control them, apply them. Um, Richard Smalley was a Nobel laureate. He won the Nobel Prize in the, in the mid-1990s for a discovery of a new form of carbon that he called the buckyball, named after Buckminster Fuller, because it was a sphere. It was a spherical, con um, conical shape, or not con a spherical shaped form of carbon. And he helped promote the federal government's investment in, nas in nanotechnology just before he died of cancer at the end of his life. He described nano in my favorite way as basically the art and science of making stuff that does stuff at the nanometer scale. I think that's probably the easiest way for us to really understand what is nanotechnology and what scale are we playing with here. When we get down to the nanoscale, we observe unique properties. Chemistry and physics work very differently at this level, and the reason why is because the nanoscale is, a, is this, it represents this transition zone between classical physics, the Newtonian laws of physics, and quantum physics, the quantum revolution of atomic-sized particles and quarks and muons. So today's scientists and engineers are finding all these new ways to deliberately make materials at the nanoscale and to use these enhanced properties to their advantage. Um, some of these properties include higher strength, lighter weight, better control of the light spectrum. These particles emit light totally differently at different scales. And more chemical reactivity than their larger counterparts. And that chemical reactivity is, is a piece that I think is really interesting. We see up on the slide there on the far right an example of nano aluminum. We have aluminum all around us, right? Every can that we've ever had that's all over our cars, it's over, you know, it's, it's, it's a part of our everyday life. Aluminum is, is a very abundant element on Earth. And it's harmless. But when we have aluminum at the nanoscale, it's incredibly reactive with air. In fact, it, it ignites. So much so that NASA and the federal government um, and the military are interested in using it for rocket propulsion. Right? So aluminum, this very harmless substance, totally different at the nanoscale. Uh, gold spherical nanoparticles, you see in the light here, the, the bottom image on the right, on, the, on my left, um, that, that nano gold at different sizes of the nanoscale, react, reflect light differently. 
So that's all the gold. That's all the same gold, the very harmless material that we have that's gold that we wear in our rings a lot or in our earrings. Um, when you get down to the nanoscale, at 25 nanometers, spherical gold nanoparticles are red. At 50 nanometers, you double the size, uh, which you know at the nanoscale isn't a ton, but you're, you're 50 nanometers, they're green. At 100 nanometers, they're orange. They reflect light, the light spectrum, differently. Part of that has to do with, uh, and this is my brief understanding, is that gold, gold's electrons at the nanoscale are so confined that that quantum confinement, that restriction, makes their reaction with light different. Similarly, silver is blue at 40 nanometers and yellow at 100 nanometers. So properties also change. On the, on the right-hand side, another carbon... Um, carbon nanotube, carbon at the bulk size is pretty darn soft. We've all felt charcoal, we've all rubbed it on our hands and had it on there. But at the nano level, if you superheat carbon, the molecules bend into a tube or into a sphere, a carbon nanotube here, that's unbelievably strong, tensile strength of steel, and also incredibly conductive. It can, it can make electricity travel through it and also heat. Um, so things change differently at the nanoscale. Now, why? Why does size matter here? Part of the reason, not every reason, but part of the reason has to do with surface, right? So the smaller the size, the greater the surface area. The greater the surface area, the more reaction it has with its environment around it. And the, the way I think I like to think about this is with an Alka-Seltzer tablet. If you drop the Alka-Seltzer tablet in water, it starts to fizz. What would happen if you crushed that Alka-Seltzer tablet into a powder and dropped it into the same glass of water? What would it do? It would, it would fizz over the top, right? I mean, you just have this foaming thing all over your, your counter. That's, the reason why is it's the same material. It's the same Alka-Seltzer. What you've done is you've crushed the powder up so that now those little tiny dots of Alka-Seltzer are touching more and more water to react and fizz with. Whereas the tablet was only a really big piece and only that flat pieces on the outside were touching the water. All of the particles of the Alka-Seltzer on the inside of the tablet weren't reacting. They were just sitting around with other Alka-Seltzer tablets. So when you shrink the size, the reactivity increases dramatically. And that's, part of the, that's part of the reason why nanoscale is so unique and, and important. Now this can lead to a lot of different applications. Researchers are trying to, to apply some of these different qualities, and we mentioned some of them here, delivery of, of specific drugs. So instead of taking chemotherapy to deal with cancer, we can uh, try to create drugs that will go and, and find a cancerous cells, have sensors they can recognize cells that are self-replicating uh, out of control, and then deliver the drugs just to those cells. Instead of poisoning your entire body, you're poisoning just the part of the body that needs to have um, the cancer stopped. That's one idea. Another one is cloaking objects to make them less visible. Making solar cells that are not only more efficient because they're more reactive, they can absorb different spectrums of the light scale much broadly than other types of, of bulker material, but also flexible. Right? We've also mentioned this idea of printing, printing uh, electronics onto paper or onto fabric so we could wear our electronics. We could wear things that move as we move. We'll charge them. That the, I mean, the, it's, a, it's a whole new world that the nanotechnology, the ideas of it, uh, at least theoretically, can allow. Another idea is for environmental remediation, and this is something I'm really interested in, is using nanoscale iron to insert into a water table of a toxic, uh, toxic event, especially at a Superfund site, and then being able to, that those nanoscale particles are reactive with the toxins, with those hydrocarbons that are in there. They absorb onto the iron these nanoscale irons absorb all of the toxins, and then you can run them through and pull the, pull the iron out with the toxins in it and help clean some of the sludge that's left over. So remediation techniques uh, with nanotechnology being used by the EPA. And then again, we have for um, insulating and heating. This, the picture on the top left there is a nanoporous material where a flame a blue heated flame is shooting up from the bottom, but the flower untouched, this very delicate soft flower, is, is perfectly fine. So incredible insulation uh, capacities. Really, again, you, each nanomaterial, though, has different unique properties. And that's where some of the challenge for nanotechnology is coming in. For nano-enabled products, already the consumer market is full of, na of products with nanomaterials in them. Some of them are, are fairly benign. Um, for example, 
bikes bikes that are instead of making with carbon uh, fibers they're made with carbon nanotubes so extremely lightweight but extremely strong tennis rackets the same using carbon nanotubes to make these super lightweight but very strong tennis rackets more commonly used in our sunscreens We've all seen sunscreens, at least in the past decade. As, as kids, you remember we would wipe it on our faces and we'd just get that white streak that would stay there. And you really had to rub it in to get the white particle to go away, to get it into your skin. Um, but today, sunscreens almost go on clear, right? They look white in your hand, but when you wipe them, it's almost instantly clear. The reason why is that nanoparticles are involved in this, nanotitanium or nano-zinc oxide. Those particles are so small that they still refract UV light but they, we don't see them, right? So we're using nano, nanotechnology in our sunscreens. Does that bring up any questions for people? <laughs> right? What do these things do? What do they do inside our bodies? Uh, especially a lot of cosmetics. Um, my wife wears a lot of eye makeup, or not a lot. She wouldn't, she wouldn't like me saying that. Um, <laughs> She wears. She doesn't wear much makeup at all. She, the only eye makeup she wears is eye makeup. And um, cons cosmetic products are also taking a lot of advantage of these nanomaterials. Um, a concern with those is not only that we're putting it on our skin, but a lot of these things come into powder form, and so we inhale them. Then. It's a whole no another entryway into our into our own inner ecosystems. Um, stain resistant pants, uh, acne lotions. Silicon, uh, nano silicon on computer components that we can put more and more transistors onto a microchip to help Moore's law and the speeding up of computer power continue. Um, Intel is already using nanoscale transistors on its, its, um, its microchips to include more and more power and space on a smaller chip. Nano silver is being used a lot in wounds, band-aids. Right? The reason why is that silver, and we've known this for a long time, is anti-bile. It's antibacterial. It'll, it will kill other cells, um, which is why you would often see silver chalices in cups because you would put the wine in there, and it, usually that wine wasn't going to adopt, uh, uh, have a lot of bacteria growth in it because the silver would help combat that. At the, at the nanoscale, silver is still very, very reactive to, uh, is, is very, basically a biocide. So we can put it into wound dressings, and not allow fungus or infestation to happen in your wounds. And so it's becoming more and more used in hospitals. Um, also in athletic products, nano socks, nano athletic gear, so that you don't have smelly clothes, right? The bacteria that your body is emitting that helps make our clothes stink, well, nano aluminum, nano silver will help eat those and so you don't have smelly clothes. So these are just some of the ways that nano is being used um, in, our, in our everyday world, in our consumer products already. This image here is what's called a nano value chain, and it helps us understand the way that nanoparticles move through economic chains and how they get, um, I guess not replicate is not the right word, but how they're used by different industries. Right? So on the far left, we have the basic materials, the basic nanoparticles themselves, nanotubes, quantum dots, um, fullerenes, etc. Then we think about what are they used? What are they used for? They're used for catalysts. They're used in circuits. They then get put into intermediary products. They become part of other products, whether they're carrying drugs, whether they're used as sensors, whether they're coatings in ink, and they get put into tires, processors, textiles, electronics. Um, these are then sold in all sorts of different industry sectors, the medical industry, the electronics industry, consumer goods, etc. All of those actors in the bottom are helping facilitate this. This is the environment that's helping um, adapting and using nanoparticles for, for our everyday use to help ideally to make life better. So the value chain shows how nanomaterials are used to create nano-enabled products. Nanotechnology is essentially, we can think of it as an enabling technology that allows technologies to do more, right? We don't necessarily use them just alone. We're using them for something bigger, as usually as a part of other technologies. Now, these properties that we've talked about and these, these opportunities they allow are, are big, big, big money. Um, Government funding, we've mentioned, since 2000 has spent at least $13 billion just on nanotechnology alone. That says nothing about the solar energy investments that, that don't have to do with nano, or the nuclear investments, or the investments in the federal government um, that, uh, of anything else. But just nanotechnology, $13 billion. It's 
spread across 20 different federal agencies. In 2011, uh, one of the research companies that really looks into the way nano money is being spread around estimated that total public and private investment globally was around 20 billion. And for the first time, just a couple years ago, it seemed that corporate investment, not just government investment, public investment, but corporate, private investment, was exceeding the public money for the first time. Now, there's a lot of uncertainties about all of this stuff. In fact, our questions far outnumber our answers for what we understand about nano. So despite this massive public and private investment in nanoscience research, we have a lot of questions. Um, the questions have to do with how nanomaterials behave and whether they pose risks to either human or environmental health and safety. How do these things work in nature? Are there EHS issues involved, what we call environmental health and safety issues? Do these things degrade over time? Or do they last for essentially, as far as humans are concerned, forever? I mean, are these things that will be around for millions of years? Uh, if we regulate nanoparticles, how do we even find them? How can we detect them? Right? And how to track something that's a billion times smaller than a meter? a billion times smaller in a meter. This is essentially one of the analogies I've heard. It's like looking for a needle in a haystack. If the haystack was the Grand Canyon, if you had the Grand Canyon and you filled it with hay and you were trying to find a needle in there, that's essentially the size scale that we're looking at for, for nano, nanomaterials. Um, there are also a, a great deal of toxicological and ecological challenges that are involved in this. Um, let me see, am I working here? Yeah. The tiny scale and the unique properties present really major difficulties for what we consider traditional toxicological risk assays. The way that we can understand how risk works and how we even understand whether something is, tox is toxic or not. So for example, nanoparticles are so small they slip past a number of our body's barriers. Skin, for example, easily readily absorbed into skin, some particles are, but not all. And this is a caveat I think is really important before we get into um, uh, too much fear about nanoparticles and the fact that they are in our everyday world, is that each nanoparticle has totally different properties. So we can't assume when we think of something at the nanoscale that it will be bad or good. Each one acts totally differently. They're almost like people that way, right? Each individual can act in its own way, bad or good. So we can't treat, treat them as, as nanotechnology, as this broad, open field. It's really, really unique to each element. Um, but a number of nanoparticles can move past the blood-brain barrier. They're so small that they, they slip past um, the molecular level that allows particles into the brain. That could be a really great medical application. It's darn difficult to get into the brain to deal with tumors, to help repair nerve damage that's done there. If we can find ways to get nanomaterials to go in there and help deliver medicines that allow for rejuvenation, this is an awesome, awesome application. However, if we happen to be finding things that are toxic to us and they move into our, our brains and then also bioaccumulate there, that could be a real challenge, a real threat. Um, so a, a, a difficulty with this is that Traditionally, the old toxicological maxim is that dose makes the poison. However much you have of it, there's going to be a threshold where eventually it becomes toxic. Well, with nanotechnology, it doesn't quite work that way. Where the dose is so small. Right? I mean, the scale that we're working on is so infinitesimal, and it reacts so differently because of that scale size that dose does not make the poison in terms of nanoparticles. This makes it really challenging for what regulators are supposed to do. How do we control these things? How do we deal with them in our everyday lives? And how should the federal government uh, be responding to these? Especially when we deal, when we live in a globalized world, a globalized economy, where these materials are moving through economic chains at a global scale and across the planet. How do we deal with these issues? And these are issues that are, again, we don't have answers to. These are, these are, these are open for debate. Um, so in terms of regulation, the regulation of nanoparticles has been discussed and recommended for over a decade, really since the beginning of the National Nanotechnology Initiative and more and more understanding about nanoparticles came forward. But there's no agreement exactly on how we should do that. Scientists debate among themselves about the best way to deal with regulatory issues in nanoparticles. They even debate about what the definition of a nanomaterial is. At the beginning of the talk, we, I mentioned that the original federal government definition was from 1 to 100 nanometers is a nanoparticle. 
But does that mean something that 101 nanometers is not? If it also has unique and reactive properties at that scale? Or what about if these particles, again, this is an enabling technology, are put into other technologies? So we have carbon nanotubes that are part of a bigger piece of carbon fiber in an airplane that help make it lighter and more, less weight but still strong, saves on fuel. But do we consider that airplane and the carbon fiber of it a nanomaterial? How do we regulate these things is still a very open question. And in the, again, in the meantime, man-made nanoparticles have spread to almost every area of our lives. And I'm interested in increasingly use of nanotechnology in food. And I'd be happy to talk about that a little bit later if you all are interested. Um, but clothing, medicine, our shampoos, our toothpastes, our sunscreen, our electronics, thousands of products in our everyday lives are, are u making use of these new nanotechnologies. Now, additionally, another challenge is that companies will shield whether they're using nanotechnologies. We just had in California that recent uh, bill that didn't quite pass but was very darn close of labeling GMOs. Right? How do we know if a product, if we want to avoid it or if we don't, right now we don't necessarily even have a choice because they're not labeled. The same thing with nanotechnology. Often companies will say part of the benefit that they're using these new technologies is this is proprietary information. They're not willing to share that. They're not willing to make that public because that allows their competitors to harness the same thing and, and capture the profit benefit from it. So companies are not necessarily willing to open up the details on whether something contains it. Additionally, these are very difficult to detect. And we don't really have protocols for judging their effects. We haven't even developed the right tools for tracking them. So our inability to imprecisely quantify the toxicity of nanomaterials means that regulators have to make decisions to mitigate these risks based on incomplete information. Now, this is a theme that I know you earlier had discussion on climate change uh, as part of the, the global theme for this year, the global theme of science and society. And similarly, our knowledge of science, the body of knowledge of science, is something that's always changing. Because science, again, is a process. So we'll always have a degree of uncertainty. We will never know anything absolutely for sure because a new discovery could, could unearth our previous understanding of that body of knowledge. So we're always making decisions based on science within the realms of uncertainty. With nanotechnology, we're dealing with a lot of uncertainty. But we still need to make decisions. And that's part of what we try to do at the Center for Nanotechnology and Societies, address some of these issues. What are the social implications and consequences? What are ways that we might move forward as a society and not just as uh, a top-down uh, technocratic view of what, what, how we should move forward? So the issues involved in these, again, are applications versus implications. And this is a balancing game. Uh, again, nanosilver is antibacterial. What a great application. And yet, when it washes off our bodies, it sometimes is moving into our food chains, into our, into our water systems, and our water treatment plants aren't able to detect them or remove them. So they're coming into our faucets, or, or they're being used on collected rainwater and then sprayed on crops uh, as, as a way of saving water, and yet those crops are also absorbing these particles and then putting them even into their germ, into the reproductive germ, the part of the plant that we eat, the seeds. Um, these are major, major challenges. The applications, the implications are very interdependent and interdynamic. Um, again, nanoaluminum, harmless at the bulk scale, extremely explosive at a high scale. Nanotubes, light, strong, they conduct electricity and heat. What amazing properties these things have. And yet, they're shaped like asbestos. They're long and thin. So workers, not necessarily you and I who would be using these embedded in bigger products, but workers who are creating those products, there's a real threat the same way that asbestos was of inhaling these and not even seeing the effects for 20, 30 years before the asbestos-like similar cancers would develop in one's lungs and the scarring of the tissues. Um, Please, please. So the shape is the same thing. The shape of asbestos is really what the, what the challenge of this is. And the reason why is that they're so small and thin, both asbestos and carbon nanotubes, that if they are put into the air and inhaled, they get so deeply embedded in our lungs that they, they don't remove. Uh, one of the great features about asbestos and carbon nanotubes as well is they're um, often hydrophobic, meaning that they don't break down in water, they kind of repel water. So our body's natural way of 
of getting rid of these things, we can't expel them from our from our, the air, and they embed in the cells that eventually create in our lungs, deep into our lungs, and that eventually creates um, uh, cancerous growth and scarring of the lungs, so that you can't expand your lungs and inhale as much air as you could, and eventually over time, you either suffocate or the cancers uh, spread and moved, and then that's another way of bad things happening. So part of what we're doing at the Center for Nanotechnology is to try to understand where nano came from, where it is, where it's going. And in order to do that, we really need to understand the social and environmental implications of nanotechnology, not just study its scientific properties and its applications. So that's one of the great things about the center that we have on campus here. And another one that's located down at UCLA, ours here at UCSB is focused on the societal implications. And the one down at UCLA that Santa Barbara does have a, a good connection to and a lot of research actually done here on the environmental implications. So this area, this part of the country and the, the research that's happening here is really unique. It's unique in, in the world and certainly in the United States for thinking about these issues in a broad way. Please. Is there also direct uh, experimentation with nanotechnology? Absolutely. And then what's the relationship between that group and you all? Yeah, there, that's a great question. Um, can everyone hear that? What? Mm -hmm. okay. Sure. Um, she'd asked is, is there material science research on the, nano, the, the science of nanotechnology, the nanoparticles and materials themselves? And if there is, what's the relationship between our center for the social implications um, nano and society. Um, and the answer to that question is there is there is a ton of research going on. Graduate rankings just came out. Uh, you know, there's all sorts of different kinds. One of them rated UCSB's material science program as the best in the nation. So there is phenomenal amount of, of nanotechnology and material science research happening at UCSB uh, at the nanoscale. And the Center for Nanotechnology and Society does some work with a lot of those researchers in the sense that we pull some science fellows to come be a part of our center to learn about some of these issues and then to share them with their own colleagues um, and also as a way of helping fund them but to get them involved in thinking about these. Another way is sometimes we'll send researchers in in a, in a and our center is extremely interdisciplinary. Again, I'm a historian looking at these. We have uh, anthropologists, we have sociologists, political scientists, and again, science fellows that also come in and participate. So we'll sometimes send anthropologists in and observe what's happening in the lounge and do an ethnographic study. How are these people behaving in the lab? How do they think about risk? What is the culture of human behavior within the lab of these materials? And then how does that shape our, their understanding of the science, right? So this is that interrelationship between the process and the knowledge of science. So there is, there is it, maybe not as much as I, as I would like to have seen, but it's certainly, um, it's certainly a, a big component of what CNS does. And can you say something about the rest of the world? Or is, our, is China and Europe uh, going full bore on this? Absolutely. Yeah, China has a major nanotechnology initiative. Japan as well, Germany as well. India is moving into it. Um, Latin America has strong programs in, Latin, in, in nanotechnology development and research, especially in Brazil. Um, so this is a global this is a global phenomenon. When the United States put put its flag in the ground and said nanotechnology is where the government will invest major amounts of science money, uh, sort of the next Apollo project, that sort of funding that we hadn't seen since an Apollo project, in 2000 when the Clinton administration said nanotechnology is where we will go for science funding, the rest of the world followed. And in some ways, the rest of the world was already doing aspects of nanotechnology. They just didn't necessarily call it nanotechnology. And I can get into some background about where that, what that is. Why do we have this understanding of nanobots and that being an aspect of nanotechnology and also nanomaterials and nanoparticles and these applications? How do these things coexist with the same name? And that has to do with the history of it. It seems to me that we're in a um situation where look before you leave. He who hesitates is lost. <laughs> <laughs> and what it seems to me understanding what little I understand about human nature and its proclivity to get things wrong, um, who's going to stop nanotechnology? 
I don't think there is stopping nanotechnology. <laughs> Um, it's interesting you bring that up because one of the major organizations that first came out uh, to, to address some of these issues and the, and the social implications of it, before the CNS was founded, before the government put aside special monies to look into the societal implications, again, we are a government-funded institution, so the government is putting forward ideas on looking at environmental and social implications. But one of the first non-governmental actors, an NGO that, that did this, has called and still calls for a moratorium on all nanoscience research. And that simply is just not going to happen. I mean, it just won't, especially at a global scale when there is no one world government to actually have an authority of controlling that. It just won't. So what we need to do is learn to work within existing means or how to, how to, how to change regulations at a nation state level to control some of the way it is going to develop. So I think that's a great... They're called ETC Group. They were um, named Erosion Technology and, gosh, I don't remember what the C stands for, um, but ETC Group. They're a Canadian-based organization. And they put out a, a report in 2002 or three, around the same time that Prey and these nanobots ideas were really getting a lot of public, um, public attention. And they put out a report called The Big Down. And ETC Group has a website that publishes all of their reports and their materials. They were originally concerned about biotechnology, and they followed the issue of seeds, biologically engineered seeds, into the nanotechnology movement and saw there's a lot of similarities here. And in fact, because of some of ETC's actions, because of some of these concerns, Michael Crichton's prey, other sort of ideas that were Prince Charles talking about nano, nanobots, um, the federal government held hearings, congressional hearings, on what are the societal implications of this project that we're putting billions of dollars into. And at these hearings, a number of people came forward and gave testimony, including members of ETC Group, including very renowned scientists. And it was out of that debate, that dialogue within Congress, that they said, we need to have a national center that looks at societal implications. And that's what the UCSB Center for Nano and Society is. It came out of some of these concerns. So even though the federal government efforts are not really aimed at nanobots and concerns about gray goo, and the societal implications have really moved past that, those ideas, um, the, the fact that we have a federally funded social implications research center on nano came out very much out of the ideas about it. Right, so that even even these public these public concerns and conceptions about what is nanoscience have shaped the way that we are moving forward today to try to regulate or put forward ideas for control. Why, why did UTC uh, ask for a moratorium? Did, did they have any findings? They were concerned about the shape and structure of carbon nanotubes in particular. Those were one of the first ones that were um, getting used a lot. They have since become more concerned about nano silver in the same way that we've developed a lot of, of resistance, biological resistance to um, penicillin, that if we continue to use nano silver at the same way, same rate, wouldn't these, these organisms develop some sort of way, at least the really gross ones that we don't want to deal with, develop similar resistances and evolve beyond them. And so we need to be a little more concerned about how we use them, let alone what's happening inside our bodies. There were, and I'm not sure if it's still in the market, but there was a washing machine that used nano silver to help clean your clothes, right? This is, what it's, again, this is a great application if we can understand what that does to our bodies. Is nano silver fine at the nano scale? Does our bodies absorb it and just get rid of it? Fine, great. Do plants absorb it, and then not, nothing really happens to its growth cycle, or what happens to the, the, the germs that we, the plants that we eat? Um, then great. That seems like a really uh, cool application and use, right? So all science isn't bad, of course, but we do need to think about these broader impacts. Other questions? Uh, could you say more about the benefits the way I heard you so far? Uh, one of the benefits is for mm -hmm. consumerism, make things better for consumers. Another benefit is to relieve some medical symptoms that are bad. Uh, I don't know what proportion of the population has those symptoms. Are there any other benefits? And I'm getting to yeah. the question of yeah. why are we doing this? Yeah. The, the, As opposed to not that we can do it, but why? That's, that, that's a great question to always ask, not just because you can, should you. Um, I think those benefits really are phenomenal, and I think they can change the way that we work in the world. 
in particular, creating greater efficiencies that would save energy and um, really help us deal with some of these environmental crunches that we continue to face as, as global economies and populations are surging, right? Creating way more efficient uh, solar energies. Transferring electricity in a way more efficient way so that heat and electricity isn't lost in the process of doing that. So some of these, some of the properties of some nano materials can, are, are incredibly enabling and very worth pursuing, particularly the medical ones. The medical ones are not just about dealing with certain brain issues, but of any kind of um, treatments and, and targeting specific disease in a way that is is phenomenally unique and also incredibly effective. Is so, knowledge and we don't know the risks. That's 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 always a concern about any kind of science, any kind of application of anything. Right. right? So we just don't know what the future is. Come coupled with unknown risks. All benefits come with cost. All applications have implications. But unknown as well as known. That's right. That's right. Yeah, I think that's a great point. Um, this might be a, a time that we could either take a little bit of a break and come back, or I can kind of run through quickly and talk about the way that we structure some of our research at the Center for Nanotechnology and Society. How do you all feel about, do you want to take a little break now, or do you want to move forward and, and, and talk about how the CNS is organized? Forward. <laughs> forward it is. All right. So the Center for Nanotechnology and Society um, is a National Science Foundation funded center. And, And this center is um, an interdisciplinary research center. It's not just uh, science. It's not just sociologists. That these are. It's a really an interdisciplinary project. And part of the reason why is that nanotechnology itself is a completely interdisciplinary field. This is a merging of chemistry, material science, physics, biology. Um, all of our understanding of science is is. Uh, works across the platforms of, of different nanomaterials, so therefore the study of it also needs to be equally interdisciplinary. The director of our center is a um, is an anthropologist, and uh, she also teaches in the feminist studies department. Her name is Barbara Her Hawthorne, and Barbara explained in a recent talk that uh, CNS is quote dedicated to understanding the relationship of technological innovation and social change. It does so by focusing on the individual on institutions and policy, and on global issues. CNS does this by drawing from many academic disciplines. Our work is motivated both by the desire to advance interdisciplinary social science and humanities, and the desire to partner with science and engineering to advance equitable and sustainable technological innovation around the world. The Center for Nanotechnology and Society, this NSF-funded center, it is a national research and education center. There are only two like them in the, in the nation. The other one is at Arizona State University. They also have a, a CNS, or a Center for Nano and Society. We serve as a network hub among researchers and educators, and we have connections across the globe of other people that work with us and work through, our, through some of our issues. But there are three main research groups that we use to, uh, to really get at these issues. And we call these our Interdisciplinary Research Group, or our IRGs. And our first IRG is the one that I'm a part of. We look at the history. We're, look at, we're interested in the origins, the communities that are involved in these, and also some of the institutions, these interdisciplinary institutions. So we're trying to figure out where did NANO come from, what's the, how is it developed. Another, the IRG2, the second one, deals with innovations. And it's interested in how do people create, uh, innovate, how does innovation happen? What are the, the structures and systems that help make that happen? And they're also interested in how that works in, in terms of globalization. So they have research projects that I can tell a little bit more about in a bit um, across the globe, especially focused on China, as was asked earlier. And the third research group is the one that Barbara Hawthorne, the director of the center, actually heads herself. And that one deals with risk perceptions. And it has to do with what does the public think about nanotechnology? How do people working in the nano industry think about nanotechnology? And how do we understand risks of these issues based on our contemporary understanding? Um, all of these things, again, work within a global framework. 
These are some of these the global uh, partners that we have at institutions across the globe, and you can see that we have a real strength in Southern California. We have a number of partners in England and also in the Netherlands, uh, even in Australia, a few in China, and we're building more and more connections in Mexico and, in, and throughout other parts of Latin America and in South America. Um, Africa, as you might expect, is is a giant continent full of a lot of people, but with not a lot of development, and so. What's interesting about the way that nano in, in, in a global scale works is that a lot of the people that are living there don't have any, there are not a lot of research being done there, but they're certainly going to be using the products there. So a lot of these risks in these applications, they should be part of this dialogue and this debate and this research, and yet um, there just aren't institutions that we've connected with. Our so tell you a little bit about IRG1. This is the one I'm a part of. And I can, again, if, if we want to after the break, I can tell you some uh, details from my research, especially my uh, work on analogies and how we think about how we use technological analogies to try to wrap our heads around what nanotechnology is. Is nano like asbestos? Is nano like a GMO? Is nano like uh, nuclear fallout? Our way that we think about nano and the analogies we make have real issues about how we will regulate them how we move forward to control them. So again, how we think matters. Um, but the broader efforts of, of IRG1, not just my, my work, is the, to, to understand the current context of nanotechnologies, um, where it is now, but especially how it got there, the past, the origins of this. Um, we look at these historical underpinnings at multiple levels, from scientists' careers to research institutions to the way that instruments were developed and new technologies evolved over time and then spread either commercially or um, just through academic connections. We look at national and state policy and also including the public's evolving perception of nanotechnology and how that's played out over time. So this is really a deep history we'd like to think of of today's nano enterprise. What we'd like to do is to really have a comprehensive and holistic t uh, story about nanotech nanotechnology's trajectory. Where is it going um, by understanding its past? And this, this begins as far back as the 1950s and 60s research, early research in material sciences, uh, lectures that, that uh, Richard Feynman gave talking about the miniaturization of matter and our ability to control it, uh, all the way up to the present. One of the really interesting things we've done is, is begun an oral history program. Who are some of the pioneers in nanotechnology? Who are the people first involved in this? And let's get their story down. Let's get what they have to say about it down and record that and allow other researchers to access it and build off the, the, those materials as well. Um, so since our group was formed in 2006, we've been, we've been collecting these oral histories and we make them publicly available. Right now we have over two dozen histories that we've carried out um, that it lasts anywhere from an hour to three or four hours, sometimes uh, spread out over a number of days before, you know, as people just are tired and, and, and want to go do a little bit more research on remembering their past before they come and talk about it again. Um, and we, we leverage with other institutions to help spread these out, including the Chemical Heritage Foundation, which is a uh, research institution based in Philadelphia, and the uh, American Institute for Physics, located outside of Washington, D.C. Um, and so that's one of the connections we do with CNS. Uh, another group is the IRG2, and that's the one that deals with innovation and globalization. And Richard Applebaum is a professor in global studies, and he's the one that heads that IRG he, uh, because of his global studies interests. He's also a MacArthur chair. He's a MacArthur fellow this year, uh, much to do with his work and his research on labor practices. He's especially interested in how, um, how nanotechnology is moving through the industrial scales of China. China has put a huge um, stamp on saying nanotechnology is also a field that we're interested in moving towards. And w what does that mean when a population and, and a, a government that's that uh, top down and, and able to really make change from the top level down is moving into a science field uh, that is can be so revolutionary and transformational? Um, some of the research they do, they actually have gone to China. Yeah, question. Sure. Interest or concern in the negative aspects? I mean, we talk about both, or do we primarily are they just very excited about the potential for good? And that's a great question, yeah. And, and how do researchers think about this? The ones that we've interviewed are pretty broad thinking, and some of them really don't. Some of them might be dealing a little bit more with instrumentation, 
uh, and thinking about how do we see, how do we even see these materials, not necessarily about applying them. So it's a pretty broad spectrum of people that we're interested in as, as thinking about as pioneers. Um, I can make mention that the IRG3 that has done a lot of research in perception and public perception about nanotechnology has looked at the way that researchers, the ones practicing in the scientific field, think about nano and the way that the public thinks about nano or the way that policymakers think. And their understandings of risk, whether there are implications on some of these issues, are different. Each of these groups have very different understandings about whether these are threatening or not. As you might guess, the people that are working within the field uh, tend to have a lower view of the risks, right? That these things maybe don't have as much uh, as concern about it, which is it we could think of as, as a real irony, but these are also the people that know the most about them. So what do we do with that information? And that's part of what IRG3 does.